Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today we have one of the highly accomplished American test pilots and pride of the Marine Corps who happens to be a truly good friend of the museum. Everyone, let's welcome Jim Sandberg. Take it away, Sandy. Thank you so much, Cindy, and I'll tell you that uh, the work that Cindy and all of the staff and the docents have done with this Western Museum of Flight for more than the last 20 years that I've been aware of it. I first became aware of the organization when it was across the runway at Hawthorne. So they've done a wonderful job and uh, want everybody to continue to support it. I'm very pleased to be here today to talk about uh, a couple of my major subjects. But the heart of it is the beautiful airplane that's out there on the ramp. It's on the left-hand side of your picture there. I never flew that airplane. I never, I came as close as anybody could to fly it, but that's another story that we won't get into. But that airplane was the, pr the, the predecessor of the most successful aircraft program in the Navy and the Marine Corps. And that is the combination of the Hornet program for the F-18A through C airplanes and the F-18 Super Hornet, the F-18 E, F, and G, which are still in production today, are the backbone of the naval aviation. They're flying in the, in, the, uh, in the South China Sea today off of the USS Vincent. They are the backbone of carrier avi aviation. Um, I think that there's probably, there were 1,400 F-18s made, and so far they've already made 1,000 Super Hornets, not to mention about 200 F-18Gs, which are the uh, EA-18 Growler, different name. So, a long time ago when I was just learning about public speaking, Roy Martin told me, you gotta know your audience. So. I'd like to know if anybody here ever worked on the YF-23? 17. 17. I'm sorry, the YF-17. <laughs> Great. How many people here worked on the F-18 program? How many people worked on the Super Hornet program? That's great. If I get any hard questions, I'm gonna call on some of you folks right there. But first, I already paid a little bit of homage to the Western Museum of Flight. This is one of my favorite pictures ever, taken by Tony Chong 20 years ago, uh, just about 20 years ago, on the ramp at Hawthorne. And it's got some of my favorite Northrop airplanes on there. I've flown all of them, except for the YF-17 in the upper right-hand corner. I already told you I didn't get that chance. But YF-23, F-20 Tiger Shark, all of the F-5s, Roy and I have flown them all around the world together, and we even delivered the last two production F-5s to Singapore in 1989. July of 1989, it was the day after the first flight of the B-2. I thought, wow, is that something special? We delivered the last production F-5 the day after the first flight of the B-2. But the Western Museum of Flights got a whole great collection of other airplanes, and many of which I've been fortunate enough to fly. So you can go over there and see the T-38. That's how I learned how to fly in the T-38. I continued off and on flying that airplane until about 1994. Uh, A-4 Skyhawk was, I grew up in Skyhawks. Flew that airplane for about eight years, got over 2,000 hours in it. Uh, the F-14 Tomcat, flew that for three years when I was a Marine in a test squadron, about 250 hours. I even, as a Northrop test pilot, got about two years worth of flying in the F-86. Uh, not all landings were the same as each other, but they did, Cindy, this did not count as a crash. I never got into the JB-1, but 44 years later, and uh, I was able to fly the B-2 bomber for work on it for four years, and there's about three orders of magnitude in the gross weights between those two airplanes. 
I've got put together a bunch of uh, statistics about the evolution of the YF-17 and then also, you know, but this is not enough time to go through this detail. Also, the evolution of the FA-18. I'm going to talk about it not programmatically, but about the airplanes. I don't have a whole lot of numbers because I can't remember them all that well. But the most important part of this evolution process is that in 1974, let me get the dates right, but in the 1970s, when the Air Force had a lightweight fighter program to develop technology demonstrators for new lightweight fighters, that program was only four years between RFP and uh, the decision by the Air Force to procure the F-16. Only four years, and yet two companies, actually two companies built four airplanes and they flew them over 300 hours in just only six months, or 300 sorties, in only six months of testing uh, in four years. That was an amazing accomplishment. I can't do that, something like that today. Part of the reason you're able to do that is because in the 1970s, every major aircraft company, of which there were many more than there are now, had regular staff of people that were working on advanced airplane designs before anybody came and asked them, would you make me a new airplane? So that's a different, another different way of doing it. I'll also say that the legacy of the YF-17 was the design of the F-17, which evolved in the F-18, which we evolved into the Super Hornet. At the end of the lightweight fighter program in 1975, when the Air Force selected the F-16, Congress mandated to the Navy, who was thinking about a new fighter jet, pick one of these two. Pick an F-16, pick a YF-16 uh, uh, or an F-18. When that decision was made, uh, and Congress mandated the Navy's selection of the F-18 was in November of 1975. In November of 1978, the first F-18 went flying in, in St. Louis. So in less than three years, they did all of the major modifications which were necessary to make that land-based YF-17 prototype into a combat-capable, carrier-capable airplane. In only three years, they built nine FSD airplanes, and the changes they had to make in that test program were relatively superficial. Not, not superficial, but they were not major things. A wonderful tribute to American technology and industry. So talk about some of the characteristics of the airplanes itself. You can see that they all kind of look together. The YF-17 was a smaller airplane, an extra 2,000 pounds of weight went into the F-18 with a much larger wing. The F-18E, which came along in the early, mid-1990s, was another extra 100 feet of square foot, an extra 4,000 pounds of internal fuel. The airplane grew essentially 20% in all major dimensions. But they all look pretty much the same. We'll talk about some of the other differences as we go along. One of the distinctive uh, de details of these airplanes are the canted vertical tails. At that time, no one anybody else had canted vertical tails. The YF-17 came out, it's got canted vertical tails. Its primary purpose was to provide good, clean air to the tails so they could have lots of maneuvering capability. So the more tails you got, the more directional stability and control that you have. Uh, same tails, same candid tails, and throughout the family and the history of the airplanes. I used to be on a Navy base and tell people, if you see an airplane in the pattern and it's got two tails, if they're candid, it's a Hornet. And if the inlets are square, it's a Super Hornet. A little while later, after the YF-17 flew, these two, are, these are, this family of airplanes came along. They also had candid tails. Not for the same reasons, I'm sure. I think they were probably canted for uh, radar signature considerations more than command and control. But that characteristic of candid tails continued through the next generation of advanced tactical fighters with the YF-22 and the YF-23. And they continue today with the F-35, which is the next new 
fighter for all of the military services in the United States and many, many countries around the world. Even the latest Air Force trainer program, the T-7A, has twin candid tails. So whoever designed twin candid tails at the beginning, they had a good thing going, pretty smart. Look at it sideways a little bit as the airplanes grew, the YF-17 on the top and the F-18 on the bottom. You can look and see that the one on the bottom is bigger than the one on the top. And that's because it didn't grow so much in plan form, but it grew a lot in gross weight, fuselage thickness, how much fuel and weapons can be carried on it. There are also some differences in the inlet design. The early versions of design of the YF-17, just the paper airplanes, even had conical spikes in the nose because they were shooting for 1.9 Mach uh, performance. But the YF-17, as you can see, is a flush-mounted conical inlet. The F-18 had a similar elliptical inlet, but it also had advanced bleed air control with some vents on the inlet to help uh, control the, bleed, the boundary layer of the air going into the inlet. F-18 had significantly larger engines. The jump in thrust between the F-18A and the F-14, I mean the F-18E, was probably about 4,000 pounds total thrust on the airplane. A lot more mass airflow is required coming on through there. So they looked at it a lot and they decided they were going to go to a much larger inlet. They selected a uh, square inlet rather than a round or elliptical inlet. It had advanced boundary layer control on it as well. Uh, it also brought to the fight a little bit of smartness for radar signature control on the inlet. I like to look at a F-18E when I look up, talk about the inlet and I look at it sideways and it reminds me of my favorite airplane on the wall, the YF-23. A lot of similarity between those two inlets, they're just canted 90 degrees. Cockpit design is always a big feature. It didn't have a whole lot to do with the Northrop crew, but it certainly had a lot to do with the success of the F-18 family of airplanes. The YF-17 had a, a relatively conventional cockpit. It was a technology program, so they put in some bells and whistles. They had some tape instruments rather than round dials. They had some push button controls. They even took a step where they ganged the two throttles together so that the pilot could only move one lever to control both uh, throttles. But when that design was selected to become the F-18 Hornet, of course, everybody knows the teaming arrangements were arranged so that McDonnell Douglas became the lead for the F-18 program and Northrop principal sub, uh, uh, subcontractor. The reason was uh, multiple reasons, but number one, McDonnell Douglas had been building carrier aircraft for years, and they were, you know, well, well experienced, certainly more than Northrop was. Another thing that I think might have been considered, certainly was important to the design, was that that advanced design team that all those uh, companies have together, Mac Air's advanced design cockpit team, had this tremendous cockpit on the right this tremendous leap in capability. It's like nobody even had computers in those days, but here we got computer screens in the cockpit. Heads up control, multiple digital display indicators, electronic moving map. This was the cockpit of the future, and it made a big difference. And those guys, Gene Adams and his crew in St. Louis, they just took that thing that they had in the laboratory and they dropped it into the F-18 design. It was critical to the success of the program, critical to the combat capability of the airplane that continues today. That was adopted in other airplanes with F-20, did it? F-16C, YF-22, YF-23. It's already expanded into other generations. F-18 Super Hornets are flying the fleet, still have that same cockpit, and there's a new Third, second major improvement to Super Hornets where they're putting in an all glass cockpit that is like, looks like this. It's not like the, F, uh, the F-35, but that, that traditional cockpit design was very successful and continued for a long time. Talk about 
aerodynamic characteristics and flight control systems. Briefly, quickly, easily. Most important one that's obvious is look at the leading edge extension. This is designed in order to provide the airplane with significant increases in capability for instantaneous and sustained turn. Maneuvering capability, important to fighter airplanes for sure. Uh, the YF-17 had a hooded design, it, it hence was the call, or the nickname of it was the Cobra airplane. It was a big Lex at that time. Uh, the F-18 had a more sculpted uh, Lex as they went through the design. They had aerodynamic reasons why they did it, uh, and it did its job well. By the time they got to the Super Hornet, they had a much bigger airplane, they had the same requirements for instantaneous turn performance, and they started out with the sculpt, same sculpted Lex as the Hornet, and then about a year before first flight, they made a change to put that big hooded Lex back on it. So there we go, transition from the hooded Cobra to the hooded Super Hornet. Flight control systems. YF-17 had a conventional mechanical flight control system with a very powerful analog uh, AFCS, if you will, um, fly-by-wire for aileron control and some degree for the stabilators. But at the time, uh, flight control system, digital flight controls or analog fly-by-wires were all still nascent and we weren't ready to make that leap. Mac Air, however, had been involved with a lot of fly-by-wire flight control development in other programs for NASA and, and the Air Force. So when that decision was made to make F-18s, they were ready, capable, and had the, te the technology to insert a fully fly-by-wire control airplane. Digital, four-channel, fly-by-wire control of all major control surfaces. The Navy customer wasn't too excited about it. They said, we're not too sure that we want to go all the way for full fly-by-wire electronic control, uh, like the Air Force did. So the F-18 design incorporated a mechanical tail feature, such that if there was a total failure of the fly-by-wire system in the airplane, the pilot would, or the airplane would automatically revert to this control uh, technique where he was controlling only the tail. And the objective on that was to provide the pilot the capability to come back, get close to the aircraft carrier, and say, watch this, and then eject. Because <laughs> it wasn't designed for landing on an aircraft carrier. On the Super Hornet, times had evolved, and the, the, the trust in fly-by-wire technology had grown. The Navy customer had had many years of having Hornets in their fleet, and they'd never had to use the backup mechanical tail ever, and they said, wow, well, this isn't happening. Maybe we should think about going to full fly-by-wire. Lots of weight savings, lots of capability improvements in the capability to it. As a matter of fact, the claptrap that was involved with the, Super Horn or with the Hornet to provide that reversion to mechanical tail was in and of itself a potential failure mode. And sometimes it would fail, but didn't cause the problem to fail, the airplane to fail. In the design process on the Super Hornet, the design team looked at that. Customers ready to go to full fly-by-wire. We want to do it. We're going to save weight. We're going to have a much better airplane. They went through the analysis of uh, potential probabilities of failure, and they found that the biggest probability of failure that would cause a problem in losing an airplane with fly-by-wire was total electrical failure. Total electrical failure, the airplane already had two generators and it had two batteries and it had all of this stuff, so they'd say, wow, two, ge two generators on two different engines. But that probability was still there, that possibility. So in the F-18 and the new engine that went into it, they, they established a requirement and built into the engine permanent man magnetic generators. Its only purpose was to sit there and to be able to provide the power required for the complete flight control system. And by doing that, increasing the number of generators, the probability of failure went up to whatever was required, 10 to the minus 6 or whatever it is at Mike that they, they require for safety. So that was an interesting way to do it and a good design. 
So I'll talk a little bit about some aero differences, and now I wish I had the pictures still up there, so remember those pictures. On the YF-17, it had the, the, the Lex, and the Lex, had, the Lex had vents on it. The airplane had nose strakes. The airplane had nose strakes up here, which provided a lot of directional stability, but it was a prototype airplane. You can't have nose strakes like that if you're going to have a radar in the front of a, a Hornet. In the YF-17 that you see out there, and this one has a straight, smooth wing. The original F-18s, when they came out of full-scale development, had a snag on the wing. It was there for carrier approach capability and give a little bit more lift. But after a while, they determined that this was not a good thing. It had more bad things to it than possible. And after about the 60th airplane, they went back to the smooth wing, just like the YF-17. And then 20 years later, when the Super Hornet design came out, we looked at it and said, the snag is back. What happened? Well, they continued to maintain, and it still flies today with the snag. It caused some other problems that had to be fixed, but they've got good reasons why it's there. I talked about the flight control systems already. I got ahead of myself. We're saving time. <laughs> High angle of attack, that's when an airplane's going to turn up its own tailpipe. That's when the fighter pilots are in there fighting for their lives, turning hard, pulling G's, high angle of attack, high left. You need to get as much maneuverability as you can in an airplane and still maintain control of the airplane. It's no good to be able to turn up your own tailpipe and then go into a spin and the other guy just watches you go into smoke. On the YF-17, had tremendous high angle of attack capability. A lot of it was because of these twin tails and another thing was very, very large slots. And those slots were there at high angle of attack to allow clean air to go through the lex up to the vertical tails and be able to still fly. Early in the F-18 design, there was a lot of concern about range, and the airplane didn't have enough range in the F-18 Hornet. It still had big slots in there, and in order to solve the range and reduce cruise drag, a decision was made to fill in those slots. Not entirely, but almost all of it. So, a little bit of that went away. On the F-18 Super Hornet, it's got very small little slots. So in any test program, there's always a decision sometimes recently to say, are we going to spin or not spin? Are we going to go and test it when we spin it or not? In the original F-18 program on the left, that spin test airplane flew for two years, uh, maybe 180 test, uh, high angle of attack test programs where they were trying to prove that the airplane would not depart from controlled flight. If you get a group of professional engineers and test pilots and you say your job is to prove that this airplane cannot depart and go into a spin, you're going to succeed. And uh, on about the fifth or seventh operational test flight that I was involved in, but only from a distance, we got inadvertently into a, a, a low speed erect spin and the pilot had to eject and the airplane was lost. So the leadership in the Navy said, well, to Mac Air, you gotta fix this. And we gotta fix it. We're gonna you do something with the, uh, the, auto, the fly-by-wire flight control system. And as soon as they came up with the solution, the Navy leadership said, take the airplane out and spin it. And after that, they proved that the, the repairs that they made, the changes, were successful. 20 years later on the Super Hornet test program, the same question came up. And we, the, the, the test community was adamant that it says, we must go and spin the airplane first to demonstrate recovery. And you can't go and prove that you can't spin, prove that you can recover, then you don't care. And that's the approach that was taken. It was very, very successful spun on the fourth flight, I think. And then after that, proved immediately that the changes to the flight control system were effective. I talked a bit about the Lurkses and the Lexes and uh, how they, they went through, et cetera. 
Um, and uh, I already talked about it. I got ahead of myself, saving more time. Cindy wanted to limit it. So this is the big lex on the YF-17. It goes up to, the, up to the vertical tails. As I told you on the early Hornets, that same pretty much uh, vents, slots, were there, but they filled them in. And that uh, had a possibility of, in any event, I was involved with the operational testing of the Hornets when that decision was made and they filled in the slots. And when we wrote our report for the operational capability of the airplane, we included in the report said, you filled in the slots, helped the crews drag and range a lot, but we don't want to know what we lost. We don't know what we lost. And we were fighter pilots and we were thinking, did we lose any maneuvering performance, uh, combat capability? That's what we were thinking about. Well, about five years later, after the Hornets had been in the fleet, some of the airplanes started going through inspection processes, and they saw that they were seeing some significant and unacceptable cracking in the vertical tails, particularly down at the base around the attach points. People here are familiar with it more than I am. I'm just a you know, knuckle-dragon pilot that taught, learned about it. But we got airplanes in the fleet. We're getting cracks in the tail. We got to do something now to fix it. So a fix was, a Band-Aid was developed. They eventually, uh, they continued to keep that uh, Lex fence. And in the production and design, people here I'm sure are aware that the strength of the tail was increased. increased. So two things were done. Cut down the vibration because by making the smooth air go there and also make the tail stronger. So there's no dumb questions. We asked that dumb question. We were thinking about turn performance. We should have been thinking about tail shaking. So on the Super Hornet, they put in these Lex spoilers in the initial design to do that same thing, to provide clean air to the vertical tails. The Super Hornet design team received significantly increased requirements for the vertical tail and strength. Uh, and the environment it was going to be in so that the tails were made strong. They were really made strong. And then in the late stages of the design of the airplane, the to I told you that the leading edge extension, its purpose was to meet the instantaneous turn performance requirement. When we got into test and we started flying the airplane, well, first I'll show you, this is a F-18A, a NASA airplane, and it has a smoke generation system where they were studying high angle of attack. And it gives you an idea here how the, the vortex off of the leading, off of the Lex is coming back, and I'm pointing at the picture. On the right, on the F-18 Super Hornet, you may or may not be able to see, but it was obvious chasing it from another airplane. When it got into conditions that caused vap vaporization of that high energy air, there was a tremendous tunnel of air powerfully uh, uh, high energy air and it went outboard of the vertical tail above the horizontal tail. So by the accident of adding that, going back to the Cobra Lex, we totally eliminated the problem with impingement of high angle of attack air on the vertical tails. That's okay, we made them real strong too, so that's all right. And we got the Lex vent to take care of it. We solved that problem drove that nail into the ground. Uh, fighter airplanes have to have store station. This uh, F-18 was a fighter attack airplane. That's another whole story. It was the first fighter attack airplane in the Navy, and as today, that, that concept has continued. For a long time, people didn't think, one pilot, how can he do the same as two, two people are doing in the airplane in a fighter, and be able to go and drop bombs? Well. It works, another entire story. But when the Hornet, when the YF-17 became a F-18 Hornet, they increased the number of store stations, where you could put bombs, where you could put missiles, from four, I think, to nine. And when Super Hornet came along, they increased it again because the wing got bigger. Hey, let's put more pylons on so we can carry more bombs. Why did we have a Super Hornet? The, uh, the reason that the uh, Hornet 
was replaced by the Super Hornet was because of the evolution in combat and combat capability. In the days of when a Hornet was introduced, when warfare was started, uh, was being employed, you'd load up an airplane with bombs, you'd go off across where you had to go and you'd go drop the bombs on the, on the bad guys. And if for some reason or other you couldn't drop the bombs and you're gonna have to go back to the aircraft carrier, sorry, we just drop them into the ocean. But by the time the F-18 was reaching a point where it was getting, the weapons were getting heavier, they were also getting more expensive because they were more capable. If you take a laser-guided bomb or a GPS-guided bomb, you don't want to drop that thing in the ocean. It's much too expensive. So the, no, the amount of weight that Hornets could be launched with in order to conduct war was limited by the amount of stores that they could come back and land with. So, they said, we need a bigger airplane with more bring-back, and they increased the bring-back capability by about 4,000 pounds. Along with the more store stations came along, always some unknown problems. Before you do weapon separations tests, can I get that? Yeah. Before you get to weapon separation tests, you do a tremendous amount of CFD analysis and wind tunnel stuff to see that it's all going to be safe. During the test program, those CFD analyses showed that there was a possibility that some particular heavyweight stores, some conditions, if they were released, might come close to the airplane, closer than was allowed by specification. So as a matter of, I believe, extreme caution, if you will, the designs were changed to provide a change to the uh, designs. I'll get back to that. I got ahead of myself again, more time saved. In 1993, before first flight, uh, when the airplane was being reviewed with customer pilots, and we start getting them involved here, they knew that this new airplane was going to be carrying three external tanks. It also had designed into it a capability to air refuel other airplanes. By one of the centerline tank would have a hose that would come on out, and they could air refuel other airplanes because they didn't have any organic tanker on the carriers anymore. But the new station that they put on the wing was also capable of carrying the same weight as a full fuel tank. But it wasn't plumbed for fuel transfers. So one of the Navy pilots said, wait a second. You got the capability to carry the equivalent of five fuel tanks in weight and you can put fuel tanks on there, but you don't have the plumbing to put fuel into those stations. Does that make any sense if you're going to go try to be a tanker? And, <laughs> and they asked Mac Air, and the Mac Air answer was, well, that's not part of the requirement. In a very short period of time, that requirement was changed. And when the airplane flew, all five stations were plumbed to be able to take gas. And very soon in our flight test program, this configuration was flown, tested, and is in, in operation today in the South China Sea where the F-18 Super Hornet is serving as an organic tanker carrying five fuel tanks and a, a, a hose to be able to refuel other airplanes. They call that configuration five wet. Back when I was talking earlier about weapon separation, I told you about the story of some stores on the inboard station going to cause a problem, maybe. So in a great ex excessive caution, the decision was made to design my, this is another one of my favorite pictures. That's me in there saying, hi, mom. <laughs> so the decision was made to take all of these wing stations and can't them outboard a small amount. I think it might be about three degrees. Not much. You would never notice. Well, you certainly do notice when you look at it, and it's kind of the weirdest configuration of any airplane I've ever seen, but it is a configuration of all the Super Hornets now. And by implementing that configuration, surprisingly, they, had, they received a very minor increase in drag and eliminated any possibility of weapons separation problems. So it was definitely considered to be a good trade-off. 
several years later when we were doing some engine out testing, doing VMCA testing, simulating losing an engine right after catapult, we would find that as the airplane, because of one engine, as the airplane started to yaw a little bit and we we're trying to catch up with it, as soon as it yawed past about three degrees, uh, all of a sudden, all of the, re the restoring functions from the downwind wing all of a sudden reverse side. It caused a problem, but it was easily solved with the flight control system because they had a powerful, lot of powerful levers to use. So I think I'm getting to the end of my time and time to get to the QAs. Yeah, I, I figured 37 minutes. So in summary, April 1972, Northrop and G were selected to produce the YF-17 for the lightweight fighter demonstration program, and so was GD, <coughs> Fort Worth, to do the YF-16. I told you it was a tremendous accomplishment that they produced those two airplanes and, and tested them in such a short period of time. In January 1975, the Air Force selected the F-16. Soon after that, the Congress directed the Navy to stop what they were doing, fiddling around a new kind of airplane, and pick one of these two airplanes. In a very short period of time, less than five months, the Navy selected the YF-17 to become an F-18. The team of MacAir and Northrop according to the books I read, was actually established and they established a teaming arrangement and legal expertise, et cetera, to have this arrangement before the congressional mandate. Looking ahead, thinking about what's the possibility, probably a risk reduction effort. Very, very cool. And again, I told you how great it was that <clears throat> that, that the congressional approval of F-18 was followed by less than three years for first flight of the F-18. So both the versions of the YF-16 and the YF-17 continue to be in production for Air Forces in the U.S. and around the world today. Two of the most successful fighter programs in two generations, certainly within my lifetime. <clears throat> and I think that the YF-17, the transition of the YF-17 to the F-18 program was associated with some significant changes in the way that companies did business and the way that engineering teams worked together in order to produce a product. And so it was that combination of the government, industry teams, and all the test and evaluation teams that were involved. Before the F-18 Hornet program, there used to be four different organizations that would do testing on an airplane before it was approved for service use. And the F-18 program, it was a combined organization for testing. So the most important lesson that I remember out of it, and I like to say, is that this is an advertising poster that the Hornet industry team put out. Great things can happen when government and industry are working together and they're in lockstep and they're flying in close formation. So that was really a powerful uh, lesson that I learned. And so meanwhile, I'd like to close up. We'll go into uh, Q&A, but I always want to end any, uh, any discussion with a encouragement to everybody here that is involved with flying airplanes to fly safe. And then, of course, in these days, we always want to be safe. <laughs> Thank you very much. <clears throat> So the floor is open for questions. Question is about the Lex vent in the Super Hornet. I told you is that big door is hydraulically actuated and would open on up in order to provide, the excuse for it was to in order to provide that clean air through the Lex to relieve the stresses on the vertical tail. I already told you that the, the hooded Lex did not impinge vortices on the vertical tail. So from that standpoint, the primary purpose of the Lex vent was not uh, required. When I was a test pilot in the Super Hornet test program, I went back to my program manager in Northrop, and I'm not sure whether it was Steve Briggs or Corey Moore, and I said, this Lex vent is, 
it, it serves no purpose. It is an appendix. We put it, God put it in there in order to prevent the vertical tails from getting beat up and never happened. And he said, no, I can't do that. I said, it, the only other purpose of the Lex Vent was that at very high angle of attack, they had a thing that was called turbo push. Very high angles of attack when the nose come up, if the pilot put the stick full forward, vertical tails would say, put the nose down and the little Lex Vents would come up to provide dump lift on the Lex and provide a little more nose down pitching moment. That feature was worthless. Now we're saying we're going to switch gears and we're going to ask about the Lex vents that, that, that were disabled. Now, early in the program, these, uh, we were doing a test. We had some wing drop problems in power approach. It was a little bit like this. What's going on? I don't understand. My airplane's kind of wiggling on around. So they did tests and a lot of them, they said, what's going on? What's going on? And we tested a lot of various configurations, one of which was not deploying, changing the flight control system so that the Lex vents did not go down. Tom Gurney was flying the flight. He was in the brief, and they briefed all these different tests we we're going to do, and one of them was to close up the Lex vents. He said, are you kidding me? How's that going to work? A problem is the airplane's wiggling around like this. These things are right close to the center line. What possible effect could they have? And when they got to that test point, they did it, and then, uh-oh, we found the answer. So we did enough tests to find out that the Lex vents were an idea to try to help, but they caused a problem, and the analysis showed that the Lex vents really weren't required, and so for many years they just were disabled, and probably around airplane 200 or something like that, they're not even in the airplane, not even designed. And I answered your question, there was another question about what did I think about the Marine Corps' decision not to uh, procure the Super Hornet. I said, no bad decisions by customers. I'm a Marine, I understand the purpose and the reasons. The Marine Corps focused primarily on the F-35. The F-35 was their most important objective, and they have succeeded in that marvelously. But in order to do that, they had to sacrifice a period of time of capability. About the same time that the Navy was receiving Super Hornets, they had old Hornets. Marine Corps was getting old Hornets so that they had plenty of airplanes to pass them through that period of time. It was the right decision at the time, and uh, besides that, if they hadn't done that, there would never would have been an F-35B, which is a significant improvement to that Harrier jet that's back there. Any other questions, please? Yes, sir. So the question, the, the question is, uh, the gentleman is, is astounded, quite frankly, by the significant changes in airplane designs in the 50 years before the YF-17, and yet then the 50 years after the YF-17, the airplanes don't look all that much different. And I'll say that's pretty much true. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And the guys on the YF-17 design team were standing on the shoulders of those giants from 1920 and 1930 and 1940. They were standing on Jack Northrop's shoulders while the man, old man was still alive. And they did a tremendous job on it. But uh, uh, I, 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 I can't answer your question. I think that they did a tremendous job. You look at other airplanes, they don't look too much different. There's a lot of similarity, and I already showed you a little bit of that. So we do stand on shoulders. Also, another thing was that uh, things are different. I told you about the short period of time between when the RFP came out and they flew airplanes, and when the RFP came out until the F-18 went into flight tests. Three, four years. We can't do that. The F-35 contract award, I think, was in 2001. The first F-35 flew about 2006, but it was essentially a prototype. It, there were so many design changes that it was never even uh, similar to the operational airplanes, which finally flew in 2009, I think. So it takes harder, it's longer. Maybe I don't know why. Next question. Well, from a pure air combat, air-to-air -air capability, the Hornet is a uh, 
better maneuverable airplane. Uh, it has uh, better thrust to weight. It has better maneuvering performance. It's smaller, lighter. It's not going to fight very long, and it's not going to fight as far away. So from my standpoint, uh, if I had to get in a gunfight in one, uh, one airplane or the other, and it was right over the airport, and, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would take the Hornet over a Super Hornet. But by the same token, Super Hornet combat capability is head and shoulders over the F-18. The F-18 uh, in service in the Navy was a fuel-limited airplane from the very beginning, and no matter what they did to it. So that a lot of the SOP operations of carriers were built around Hornets. And there was a cycle time. It said, okay, we're going to launch the air wing, and then an hour and 40 minutes later, we're going to recover the air wing. Because they got to come back, because they're running out of gas. And today, the Super Hornets can handle easily a 2.6 cycle time while they're doing relevant combat training. My, my opinion. Roy wants me to make a comment on the, uh, uh, the F-18 Hornets capability and evolution, and then also the HOTAS uh, capability in the cockpit. Is it HOTAS or HOSAT? Ah, there we go. Back in the cockpit design, and it was in my notes to say, but I didn't get to read my notes. In that revolutionary cockpit design that came on in was a, a concept called HOTAS, hands on stick and throttle. The design of the airplane was designed so that most of the functions that a pilot needed to do in combat could be done while he has his hand on a stick and his hands on the throttle. In combat, the things that he needed to do. Uh, that was particularly important when you had a concept of an airplane that was a F. A-18. Not only did he have to be a fighter airplane and shoot missiles and use his radar in an air-to-air -air mode, he had to be also be a bomber and be able to drop bombs on targets and uh, use radars and LGBs and things that were air-to-ground. So hands-on stick and throttle was a revolutionary capability brought into the original F-18 by Gene Adams and his cockpit design team and have been emulated throughout fighter airplanes everywhere around the world. Tell you the great story. I just got back from spending a couple of days up at Reno at the Tailhook uh, reunion, which is a gathering of current and former naval aviators. One of the fellows there that I got to shake his hand, because I do every time I get an opportunity, was well, his call sign is Mert, and I'm sorry that I can't remember his name right now because that's the way that it is. But he was the first pilot in combat during the Iraqi uh, conflict that was flying an F-18 loaded with bombs, him and his wingman. They're going to a target, and they're looking on their radars to see if there's any bad airplanes around, and here comes two MiGs right down the, the pike at them. They're talking with the controllers on the ground. I said, I got two MiGs coming in, hot nosing us. What are we going to do? I said, you're cleared hot. Boom. One switch of the, the hands on stick and throttle, they, the whole airplane changed into the air-to-air -air mode. They were able to designate the target on their radar and fired two missiles, one off of each airplane, splash two MiGs. And then they pushed their buttons went right back into the air to ground mode, and they rolled in on the oil field or whatever was the target they were landing and they destroyed, or aiming at, and they destroyed it. So when, when I was learning about HOTAS in 1980, thinking, boy, this is really great, but gee whiz, you know, uh, what a concept. And even when we were doing the Tiger Shark program, we incorporated a HOTAS and we said, this is great, you're gonna do it. And I was always thought in the back of my mind, gee, I wonder if it would have Mert and his wingman did it. And I'm sure that's been done before, but what a, what a story that was. HOTAS or HOSAT? I don't know. <laughs> Sir, I'm not sure I got it. It's something to do with considering the capabilities of the F-35. What do you think is the future of the Super Hornet in the future? All right, today, okay. Today, 
The first F naval F-35C is on cruise on the USS Carl Vinson in the South China Sea. They were even visited in, by the PRC. The uh, Chinese came out to take a look at it and they did intercepts on each other. They are at the tip of the sword today, F-35Cs. Also on board that airplane, Super Hornets, Growlers. Today, the Navy is investing in the third block upgrade to the F-18 Super Hornet, okay? A lot of it is in the bells and whistles in the weapon system, making the radar better. And I didn't answer your question about radar. Making the radar better. They're also adding conformal fuel tanks. Holy shakes. The Super Hornet right now has got more gas than the guys know what to do with it, but they're putting on more conformal fuel tanks. And the reason is because combat, close combat is not something that people in the Navy want to do with their ships. So they're reaching out as far as they can to protect the ships and, and to break things and kill people. So if you're going to go and, you know, that's the difference in warfare today. So the Navy believes that the Super Hornet and the F-35 are symbiotic. So there you go. They're, they're, they're making changes to the F-18 to be able to receive encrypted information from the F-35, because the F-35 has such tremendous sensor capability because of the advances in avionics, they want to share that information with the Hornets and the Super Hornets. And I got to say, with the Super Hornets, because the Hornets are all gone. I, I'm, I'm having a ball, but I don't want to hold anybody up, and, unless anybody else has got a good question. Is it okay, Cindy? I don't know when the end is. You still got tape, Bruce? Any other questions? The question is about, what about the differences in designations between F-A F -A planes and A-A planes? And the F-117 was a fighter, but it really wasn't a fighter. And uh, F-18 was a fighter and an attack. And then there was a F-A-18. I, I can't understand it. I think that the F-117 designation was more political and parochial than, than logical. I will tell you a story, though, about the F-18. You ask about designation. The original design and original contract for the Hornet, the original Hornets, when it was transitioned from the YF-17, was to, to, to produce two models of airplanes, an F-18 and an A-18. They're both going to be single-piloted cockpit or single-piloted airplanes. The A-18 was going to be primarily to replace the A-7 aircraft in the Navy. The F-18 was designed to be primarily to replace the F-4 Phantom in the Marine Corps. As the development uh, continued, there were differences initially between the airplanes that were primarily in the cockpit and the avionics system and the radar. As time progressed for a couple of years, uh, the differences merged together. There was very little differences, and I was on the test team not flying, but we were getting ready to, when the decision was made to change the designation of the Hornet from the F-18 and the A-18 to the F-A-18. That decision was made to the point where some smart decision maker in the government said, why do we have two different designations? We've always had two designations ever since contract said, what's the difference? It says the difference is the F-18 does not have a projected map display, and the A-18 does. Why not both airplanes have the same thing? Because the projected map display was so expensive. So that's not going to continue. <laughs> that's going to that, that's change, because I think the original projected map display, they're actually using microfish and, and, you know, technology. <laughs> so he said, change it, and they did. I have an original F-18 flight manual that says it is a F-18. And I have a model made by McDonnell Douglas, two models. One is a F-18 and one is a A-18. It all went away. So the gentleman's question concerned about the rules of engagement in combat, his experience in Vietnam, and I continued for many years after that, was called visual, uh, visual identification was required. 
So you could not engage and shoot down an airplane and you could visually look at it and say, that is a MiG. It's not a Boeing 707 or it's not one of our friendly A7s. It's, it is a, and I don't mean to say MiG, but it's an enemy airplane. Then he asked, or has, has technology advanced uh, beyond visual identification? The answer is yes, yes, yes. Okay. So there's a lot of different reasons why that is. At the time when I told you about Mert's shoot down there, it wasn't because of something that he had on his airplane. He was looking and he saw somebody coming at me close and hot and heavy. He called to his controller and at that time there was AWACS and uh, uh, Hawkeyes and I mean this is when we're hot and heavy in uh, Iraq. You know that air war didn't last long. A lot of, so those other people told him, they said, we know who that airplane is, we know where it came from, you're cleared to fire. Thank you. <clears throat> so there's a lot of different ways, and to answer your question, and as you advance more and more, the F-35 has an internal electronic identification capability, so do Hornets that are on the fleet today. It goes into levels of uh, how you do it, et cetera, I can't get into, but uh, that's true. Visual identification, great stories coming up there. Yes, sir? What was the max speed on the uh, Super Hornet? Uh, max, uh, max, what is the max speed for the Super Hornet? I'll tell you that in mock it's 1.85. Thank you. About 1.85. And that's the max demonstrated speed, and uh, it was done on a very unique uh, meteorological conditions. It's very much dependent on the temperature and the tropopause and all of that stuff. Sting Wallace flew that flight and he continued to say, I am the fastest Super Hornet pilot in the world. Because <laughs> that means nothing, means nothing. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a casual interest only. It doesn't have to do anything with combat capability. Yes, sir. It's about, the question is about Super Cruise. Super Cruise is the capability to fly supersonically without the use of afterburner. And he wanted to see what has happened in the evolution of these airplanes? How did the YF-17 do? He's aware that uh, early F-18s uh, were able to super cruise, um, and then later F-18s weren't able to do it. Uh, I'll tell you that I do not, I am not aware of any capability in the Super Hornet for super cruising. All of those examples that you give me of super cruising is getting down to the area of something like being at 1.08 Mach, just barely out of the transonic drag rise reason, region where you could probably fl could maintain it in military power. None of those airplanes, uh, only one of those airplanes could actually get supersonic in level flight, and that was the YF-17. YF-17 was the first U.S. Air Force airplane to ever go supersonic without use of afterburner in level flight. But it's, it's 1.06, 1.08. It's not important. When you hear people talk about super crews like the advanced tactical fighters, like in the YF-23 and the YF-22, I'm not going to tell you how fast they're super cruising, but I can tell you based on unclassified information that I've seen in print, it's in excess of 1.5. So there's a big difference between super cruising at 1.5 and 1.08. So, so it, it means nothing for the Hornets. I'll tell you that the Lightning F-35 does not super cruise. <laughs> yes, sir. The question is, uh, why F-17 was a Northrop airplane and uh, F-18s are uh, McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing airplanes? Uh, and how did that happen or what was the deal? Uh, I explained a little bit there, when the government, when the Congress told, when the government decided to choose one of the airplanes, YF-17 or the YF-17, or YF-16 or YF-17, Mack Air and Northrop had already, looking ahead, made an agreement between themselves, a legal agreement, that they're going to, if they were selected for the Navy program, they would continue and that McDonnell Douglas would be the lead prim primary contractor for Navy airplanes and that Northrop would be the principal subcontractor. 
they made that arrangement because they understood each other's capabilities. And McDonnell Douglas had been making carrier airplanes for 40 years, maybe more, uh, under different names. Northrop had never made a carrier-capable airplane before. So that was a big deal of it. Um, they also, part of that agreement was between McDonnell Douglas and Northrop was that if a land-based version of the Hornet was ever produced for foreign export sales, their relationships would reverse just for those land-based uh, models. That land-based novel uh, model, which Northrop called the F-18L, was designed, it was ready, it was prototyped in wood, never went to flight, never had a customer, caused some problems between the companies, but they all got resolved in a while. I'll tell you a little bit about the teaming, which I think is neat in the history of this airplane. And it goes back a long way, but I heard it, I, I, I knew that it was going on, but I really heard it voiced best by Steve Briggs when he was the Northrop program manager for um, the Hornet program. The Hornet program was a combinant, was, was, there's a very powerful organization between the primary four Hornet industry team members. They are, today, they are Boeing, Northrop Grumman Corporation, Raytheon Electronics and Radar, General Electric Engines. Those companies work together for the benefit of the program. A lot of airplanes don't work that way, and maybe the other contractors are trying to do something for their own personal benefit. And Steve Briggs used to say, the reason that the Hornet is so successful is because of the Hornet industry team mantra, which is, if it's best for the program, then it's best for my company. And that's how they work together. So that was it. Another thing that was of interest, when the first Super Hornet flew, it had the names of the Hornet industry team on the airplane. And those names on the uh, airplane were McDonnell Douglas, Northrop, Hughes, General Electric. At the end of the four-year test program, only one of those companies still had the same name <laughs> because McDonnell Douglas had become Boeing, Northrop became Northrop Grumman Corporation, and Hughes was assumed by uh, Raytheon Corporation. Yes? So the gentleman's question is concerning the, uh, uh, the stall resistance uh, the, uh, of the engines in all three of these airplanes, and it's true, well, they, they all use the same leaky turbojet technology. The F, YF-17 used the uh, F-101 engines. They were referred to as leaky turbojet because it's a new way of doing things, to increase the flow around the outside of the hot section of the engine. Same technique and technology was used in all of the engines. For the Hornets was the F-404 and it was increased by another 2,000 pounds with a dash number. And then the F-414 is another leap in thrust. Same technology. Um, resistance to stall. Uh, Russ Scott was the Northrop test pilot on the F-18 test program, and his responsibility, area of responsibility was for propulsion testing. When I went back there as a Marine with a Marine team to go flying, he came and I was talking with him. We're going to go fly the Hornets, and he gave everybody, the, the company test pilots would come and give us a briefing what was going on in, and it was just very simple. He said, I've been flying this airplane, doing propulsion tests, and beating these engines up as much as I could for over two years, and we have yet to identify an engine stall. The instrumentation has determined and found some stall characteristics that were impending. Pilots did not notice it, did not know it. The F-18 F-404 engine has a full authority digital engine control system. So when that was like fly-by wire on the engines. So that means that the engines were really, really smart. 
And while the pilot's saying, I want to go as fast as I can, and now I'm going to, or the engine go as much as I can, now we're going to turn and get a lot of disruptive air coming out in the inlet. The engine's giving the pilot as much as it can. Okay? In other designs, I'm going to keep giving to you, keep giving to you. <laughs> no, they wouldn't do it. So that digital sensors in the engine are saying, okay, I'm getting some inlet distortion here. It's getting into my, uh, my intake. I don't want it. It's coming into the engine. So they reduced the power on the engine. No, no, he was never able to do it. I am not aware of any engine problem in the test program for the F404. I was integral with the entire test program for four years. We had a problem with a, uh, a, fan, uh, a, a fan blade came apart. It was a problem. It had to get fixed. Engines went through remod and everything, and it was a, no problem. The engine capability is a real powerhouse. I got a lot of time for General Electric engines, and that started when I was flying F5s. And that F-18A engine, the F-404 is the engine we flew in the Tiger Shark. Now, how, how do you like to have an airplane that's really got a really good engine, and there's only one of it? One of the reasons, I think, why Northrop was able to decide that their next vision of airplanes were going to go away from two engine capability was because of that F-404. So all the shock wave at that point? The question is, uh, talking about engine stalls, what if you're a real high Mach number and you pull the throttle back uh, uh, quickly and immediately? Boy, what would that happen in F-86, Roy? <laughs> 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 don't do that, don't do that. The full authority digital engine control system is in there to give you as much as you want. So you're up there at high Mach and you pull the throttle back and say, I want the engine to go all the way back to idle, ain't gonna do it, ain't gonna do it. It's gonna come back as much as it can. I don't know, I don't know. I, I suspect that it would come out of afterburner, but that all depends on things I don't know. It, the full authority, Digital engine control unit means there's a lot of ones and zeros in there that I don't know about. Nobody, you know, a lot of people don't. Look, I want to thank everybody for your time. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I, I love talking about these airplanes because they were so very successful. They were extremely important to the advance of naval aviation and the success of naval aviation in combat over the last 40 years. Uh, I'm proud that I had a part of it. Anybody who worked on the YF-17 or on the Hornet program or on the Super Hornet program or on the F-404 engine program or on the APG-65 radar program um, should be very proud as well. Um, thank you for your attention and just uh, uh, let's just take a minute to remember the folks who died 20 years ago. Thank you very much. <laughs>